Yeah, this is John from All Points TV, and uh, this is uh, this is going to be a good habit for you, there, Laurel. You're um, out with a new book, yep. and um, <laughs> and in case people are who have been listening before or haven't, uh, Laurel Featherbush is a author, as we're going to be talking about today, and she's also a harpist out of a uh, well, she's in the Southeast Michigan area, but she her home base is you know um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Anyway, um, you've had several books out in the past what two years, three years? You've been producing quite a book, quite a few yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, they're all pretty short, so, but um, yeah, yeah I, I like to write. So. And uh, today, this one, I think this might actually get some controversy going on because um, it's called um, "Pro Life is Jewish: Why the Matriarchs Would Reject Abortion." And I'm going to give a cover of the cover of the cup, you know, copy of the book there, you know, the cover of it. And um, it seems that um, that is kind of a controversial subject amongst Jewish in the Jewish population, in the United States. Some it's, the bulk of them seem to be kind of on the pro-choice side. Yeah, that's very much um, the bulk of them. Um, you know, my, one of my friends is in political science. He did a presentation, and the statistics are something like um, 92 percent of American Jews identify as being pro-choice. So, um, you know, I'm. And, and Jews are already a small minority in the United States, so um, you know, as far as the population goes, a, a pro-life Jew would be, you know, a very small minority of our of our American population. But I would like to change that. I, I think that um, I think that this is um, this is a bad situation. So. Yeah, no, it's like you're kind of a you're kind of all about the place too. I noticed that you're kind of like um, in some you're like a pro-gay marriage, which kind of defies the political conservative groups that actually, um, you know, would be, gravitate towards being against that. I mean, but yeah, in some ways you're conservative politically, but on that issue, you're on board for it. And um, on this, you seem to be running against, I guess, the way, the best way I like the way it was a counter to your constituency, as uh, <laughs> Jack Nicholson said about abortion. He he opposes abortion as well. And um, it's been, I've known that for years, and a lot of people now are picking up on Facebook memes. And he's, a, he's an atheist. He's also very secularistic, and he's also very vehemently pro-life because, he can't, his, he found out that he, he was close to being aborted when he was still in his mother's womb. And, wow. and, uh, he's now, he, I guess he shows up to a lot of pro-life rallies, which he's kind of the odd man out because most of them are from, you know, religious backgrounds and, uh, but he's uh, the odd person out. In a similar way, you're kind of like a running counter to your constituency as well. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure exactly what my constituency is. Um, let's see, I, I guess for my politics ha- has been sort of all over the map, but for most of my life, I was very, um, very far left, and um, for a number of reasons, I became um, kind of far right. And um, now I think my positions are, it's not exactly, it's not that I'm moderate in the middle right now. My, I, I guess right now my positions are more eclectic, like some that would be identified as being left, some would be right, some would be neither. Um, so... Um, I, I used to listen, when I was on the far right side. I, w- I listened very avidly to talk radio, and you know I, I learned some things. But now um, I, I think I, I stopped listening at some point because I got kind of disgusted with the people on certain issues or topics. And then when, once I stopped listening, I you know then then you sort of become more independent. And now sometimes they say things that seem like just so stupid to me. So like, you know now I, I like to. Um, Try to think for myself more. So. Yeah, and that's that puts you at odd, odds with everybody. I mean, I say some stuff that gets people angry, and mm-hmm. um, see, I see. I gotta admit, I'm a guy, and but I never was like you know involved with a woman that had she was, she was close. You know, we were speculating she was pregnant, and we were scared. You know, like I was never a teenager, got in that position, so it was never something. Actually, I, I had friends who whose girlfriends got pregnant, and they did choose the abortion route, and I I can't mm-hmm. sit there and bash them. I did question their behavior. Because a few of them were actually engaging in sexual intercourse without any types of protection, bragging about it, for, and they're doing this for a couple of years, and then she comes out pregnant, and now it's like, oh, we got to have an abortion. I want, this could have been avoided. And I'm looked at like, you know, I'm like this, the old man of the group. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, you can't, they'll just break up spontaneity, you know. But I, I just, I think a large portion of this can be, you know, if you don't want children, take the precautions of conceiving, you know, to prevent conceiving them. That, I don't think that's horrible. I mean, it's of course the Catholics would have an argument with that, but I mean, or issue with that. But I mean, it's still, I guess, a sin in itself if you want to look at it that way. But at least you don't have to go to a greater sin, in my opinion, of killing an unborn child. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's um, 
the Jews and the Catholics would have different doctrines about um, sexuality and birth control and things like that, but I don't think that they should have different doctrines when it comes to the value of an unborn baby. And um, yeah, as, as you said, you, it's, you should take um, precautions and not, um, you know, you, sex always does lead to a baby. It's not like um, you can be sexually promiscuous and expect that it won't. I mean, it's just the, it's <laughs> the way of nature. But, um, you know, I'm not here to um, preach to anyone about their, their sex life, but that's just, um, I, I guess my big thing is that the unborn baby's life has to matter and has to be taken into consideration. And I think right now the pro-choice movement the pro-choice movement it seems like um, used to the people used to, and sometimes still do. Always say, "Well, I, I was person, you know, or I'm, I'm personally against abortion, or I would never have an abortion, but I believe that it's, you know, I wouldn't tell someone else what to do, and um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, whatever it is that." But the, people would always say, "Oh, I'm personally against abortion," but now they're not even. Um, uh, they don't even say that, you know. Now it seems more like abortion is some good, wonderful thing that um, there's nothing wrong with it, and may maybe in a way it's good that they're phrasing it that way now because at least now they're it's not hypocritical. Like if you, if you really don't see anything wrong with abortion, but you're pretending that you're personally against it, that's just hypocritical. But um, nonetheless, I, I don't th think that um, Jews are of the. Um, I think that life has always been um, Jews' highest value, and I, um, this aligning themselves with this movement that just puts no value on an unborn baby life. I think that's just not not who we are as a people. So, I, well, you know, just being a you know just sitting back as a total outsider, I've seen you know. You know, like you said, like you know, the bulk of the Jewish population in the United States is what you already alluded to, seem to be on the pro-choice side. Which, uh -huh. but um, I'm sitting there thinking, well, okay, you went through the Holocaust. You know, actually, there was other, per, you know, systematic persecutions of pogroms in Russia and all this stuff, and your population's been diminished. It's been pushed around, and yet you have this fear this is going to happen again. But how you will react to it is you're, you're reducing your own number. Right. I just don't understand that. I mean, it's like, uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think everybody should just go out to have kid after kid after kid, but <laughs> right, yeah. but there are other approaches to it. I mean, and again, you know, the Catholic Church would have issue with, like, you know, tubal ligation or uh, vasectomies or whatever. But, I mean, I think after a married couple's had three or four or five kids, they know their checkbook. They know the balance of it. They know they can't afford anymore. I don't think it, unless a church is willing to step in and give them portion of their funds each month to offset the raising of these children, I think they should stay out of the person's business. But to wholesalely have this idea that um, life is so just cavalierly or blithely done away with, mm -hmm. I think it's, um, I don't see how you can maintain that position and then want everybody to reach out for the people, the foreigners that might be coming in, like right currently, the refugees. If the, your own children's life doesn't mean anything, why should you place so much value on these people who are allegedly fleeing some kind of oppressive government or you know some kind of war-torn country? Why, why does their lives matter, but your own offspring don't? I just don't understand that. I mean, it's just almost like, too, this hatred for yourself. It's right. almost like a hatred or a scorning of oneself to want to see. That was a promise of some form of immortality to have children and grandchildren and great grandchildren possibly going on beyond you and to forfeit that because of what um yeah, yeah i don't understand that the um jews i guess is a we tend to have a value of welcoming um foreigners and the stranger and um, giving them rights and dignity and and as far as the immigration i, th I think the jewish community in general is um pro-immigrant because we were immigrants and we, you know, we've also often had to flee other countries and, you know, how that fits in with the subject of illegal immigration or how many immigrants you, um, you are going to accept in different situations, you know, that different Jews can have different opinions about that. But, you know, as you said, we, you know, we, we do believe in welcoming the immigrant and the stranger, but given that that is our value, it should even um, you know we we strangers lives are so important to us you know our, our own children's lives have to be that important to us too and the, I guess I've been using the, talking about the life of the unborn baby in Jewish um, Jewish teachings traditionally they see an unborn baby as a potential life not as being fully alive um, 
And uh, I guess I would dispute that, but to me it doesn't really matter if, if you're going to say, no, it's just potentially alive. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with that. That's one of the things I say in my book, that's just a matter of semantics. But a potential life has to be worth something too. I, I mean, just because something's a potential life, that that doesn't mean that it's, that you don't take it into consideration. And um and this is not my original argument, so I didn't put it in the book. But someone, oh, someone said that um, if you, there are situations where we consider potential lives, like we don't destroy the planet or the environment because the potential lives of our, you know, future generations, they're going to have to deal with the consequences. So those are just potential people right now, but we we still consider them. You know, they have they have rights too to have a a, a decent planet. You know, decent environment to live in so um so we do consider potential lives in various situations i guess to me what what i would consider a potential life not a full life is like an egg or a sperm or just the abstract idea of a baby like should we have a baby should we not have a baby like if it's just a you know an idea of a baby that's a potential life to me um you know or an egg or a sperm isn't fully um doesn't have that that's not a, a complete person because it needs another half. But once the egg and sperm are united, you know, and once it's a baby that's growing inside of a mother, I would say that that is an actual life. But if you want to say it's just a potential life, that's fine. But as long as you um, give it give it some weight in your equations, you know, as long as you think it's as long as you see that it's worth something to be considered. Yeah, I think that's very, those are very set of valid, you know, arguments there, are, you know, ideas, because I, I just don't, I know in the, the scripture we consider, like, to be the Old Testament, Tanakh, I think, would be the word that the Jews would use. Um, it's right in the book of Psalms, it talks about, you know, the love that this God has for the unborn. He sees them being formed in the inner parts of the mother and all this stuff. It goes, I mean, a different variation of, you know, the versions and the translations, but there's this uh, understanding, I would say, was kind of, you know, throughout, wove throughout. Judaism about the value for the unborn mm -hmm. and I would say that's like that's you know then that's actually picked up later and woven into the fabric of Christianity mm -hmm. um so I, I I mean like I said I don't want to get like overly harsh and I think that actually the left does have a valid point when they always tell the you know the right wingers okay you you love the babies as they're like you know they're this abstraction you want to protect the innocent you know unborn okay that abstraction but you balk at actually now having to pay for these children once they're here and I mean, and that's, you know, I got to say that point, that point is valid. I mean, how many times I've heard, and so, you know, what well, people say, I don't want to pay for these kids. Well, then if you're marching in a pro-life thing, you, in my rally, you're going to have to realize if somebody's having a kid and they're poor people, it's going to come back on society's, you know, bur uh, on their shoulder. It is a burden. I'm not going right. to lie about it. Well, Jews actually tend to be kind of liberal on, on social issues and paying for people. So... If a Jew were pro-life, I, I think that they would be pretty safe from being called a hypocrite because they would probably also be for <laughs> for paying for for the baby. Also, I mean, you can you know, b people have different opinions about where the money would come from, but I I think Jews do believe in, in taking care of society. You know, whether that comes from the government or from charities is one thing, but that's always been a very strong thing in the Jewish community is to um, take care of of the whole community. Yeah, I, I would say that you're accurate on that. I mean, it's like they're always on the, you know, Jews have a tendency to be on the forefront for uh, social, uh, welfare and social programs and stuff like that. And I see, I, I can see both sides of that issue. I mean, I can see that, see, in the United States, though, we can't do as much for the people who are affected by, say, uh, devastating illnesses and stuff as we should be able to because simultaneously we're also fighting battles all over the world. We've we got a military mm -hmm. presence all over the world. I'm not bad-mouthing the uniformed individual in the field. for you know, they're doing, They hired in for a job. They're doing their job. I can't find fault with them getting paid. But uh, there's also a lot of corruption going on within the contracts of that, you know, the military. It's a military-industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower referenced it when he left office and told people to be aware of it. And the irony is it's lost a lot of people now. He was a career military man. He had been a general during the Second World War. He had been the person in charge of Germany after Germany capitulated at the end of World War II. And he was warning. He saw the corruption and basically this almost the idea that we're creating wars just so we could sell you know, products for these people who are the uh, defense contractors is not totally absurd. Hmm. You know, the, you know, so, I mean, I can see where he, and he warned against it. He was, of course, it was his uh, speech, right? I think it was um, Carl Hess is his name was. I think it was the one that actually put hmm. that in there. But um, 
I might be mistaken on that, but he, I remember Hess talks about that in his book. Um, but, you know, there's a valid concern there. I mean, so these, these issues like are problematic and they're thorny because if you go too far on one extreme, you're going to be accused by the other side of ignoring the problem. You know, America has got to be safe. It's got to be secure. We've got to, be, we've got to have the military presence. And that can't be really argued against because we've seen indications, but we're also the cop for everybody else on the planet. Hmm. And the reason why we can do a lot for, we do, a, we do so much for them militarily, they can actually concentrate on internal and domestic pro issues for themselves, tax themselves really high, and spend that money on stuff other than military spending because we're taking care of that for them. We're trying to, we're, we're, our, our needs for that is expanding as well as for the need for our military presence in some people's eyes is also expanding. So which one's going to be on the chopping block? Hmm. You know, that's what it boils down to. Because America being the, you know, the world cop is costing us a lot of money. And so, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, that all weighs in, well, you know, abortion and people opting for abortion or be proponents of it, you know. So, um, can, can, can I'm you sorry, how, how are you thinking of that as being um, con connected to abortion? Well, because it's the social programs. The money's got to be the prioritization of monies. I mean, it's right. like, yeah, you got to, okay, are we going to spend it on, on a defense? Are, you know, the military presence or we're going to spend it on domestic problems, you know, and domestic issues. There's only so much pull. They can only tax people so far before it just basically is going to fold in on itself. Where's well, the money going to be going to? Well, it depends to? whether you think of people as an asset or a burden. And, um, you know, people often look at, oh, there will just be all these, you know, I think there's often an attitude of, of there being too many people or ex more people than we need, you know, if only there were fewer people, things would, you know, that, that somehow people are, are a burden. And I, I don't think that that's a way that we should be looking at other human beings. You know, I, because for what, well, for one thing, I, I just don't think it's accurate. I mean, people are our greatest asset. People can build things and create things and come up with new ideas. And, um, you know, this idea that more people is just more mouths to feed without any added benefit, I, I don't think that's that's the way things are. <laughs> and I don't think that's the way, um, you know, as, as a Jew, I don't think the Jewish tradition sees it that way. And you know, we're supposed to value each person, like we're supposed to value um, the widow, the, um, the stranger, the orphan, you know, we, we're not supposed to look at them as burdens or unnecessary, that you know, those are all vital members of the community. And, and I think that, um, you know, and I, I think that that's, um, I just don't think we should be looking at it as, well, we have to be getting rid of more people. So No, I agree with you that. I mean, I, I think basically, um, well, I remember reading, um, it was a, just an introduction thing of Iris Murdoch. She was a novelist. She was also a philosopher in her own role, right? And she wrote, she, that's what her degree was in, is philosophy, but she also wrote novels. She just mm -hmm. died a few years ago. And um, she took the, uh, you've heard the expression, uh, you know, um, Sartre said, you know, you know, hell is other people. He was in the, in the, in the play, No Exit, you know, mm -hmm. basically hell is other people. Dealing with hell creates, I mean, people is hellish and nightmarish. <laughs> and uh, she took it and says, well, if it weren't for other people, you also won't have the chance for the great things in life, you know, right. the interactions, the, the, the otherness, you know, and stuff like that. So she made it kind of counters that point beautifully, too, I think. And uh, she was a secularist. I mean, she wasn't a believer, but she also right. wasn't like a vehement atheist either, mm -hmm. but... She saw that the value of other people. Right, that's wonderful. Yeah, and um, I can also relate to that statement, hell is other people. I mean, you know, I could relate to wanting to get away from other people too at times, but basically, yeah, we ha I think we have to love each other. Yeah. Well, it's like, I think, yeah, I mean, let's face it, we, I mean, we all, like somebody says, if you actually talk to somebody, you think they was, wish they were dead, if they're like, some people are like real going through like a depression. They mm -hmm. said a lot of times they wish they were dead. But if you actually start, you ever start peeling apart their argument, they never wish they were somebody else. They just wish the conditions of their life were different. Mm -hmm. They never wish they really were somebody else. They right. wish their conditions would pattern somebody else's, but they still want to be themselves, right. enjoying yeah. that. Yeah, you would never want to have someone else's problems. I mean, <laughs> at least your problems, you're sort of used to them. You know how to deal with them, but then you look at someone else's life and you would have no idea what to do. Right. About, with it. Because you don't have, and see, that's what it all comes back to. We do have a point, a purpose for this, you know, this discussion here, folks. It's like a, basically life does matter. Mm -hmm. And um, I think on every, if you, it's just, you know, this a hard cut blanche, I mean, it, when I was growing up, it was just that an argument was out there. You know, abortion had already been made legal by Roe v. Wade in, what, 72, 73. Um, and, um, you know, we all grew up, I mean, let's face it, when I, you know, I was a 17, 18 year old, that's already been in existence for several years. I mean, that was, you know, for us, we didn't exist before that. You know, we didn't see the world before, you know, this being allowed. 
So I mean, it wasn't really questioned. And we heard all the people haranguing about it, arguing about it, but it became background noise for many of us teenagers. Mm-hmm. But, and this isn't one of the things I have in my book because it's not my original argument. I didn't want to be taking credit for other people's observations. But um, legalization of abortion is not what cut down on, on maternal, um, you know, women dying in abortions. Like that, what, what was actually the major factor was the widespread um, availability of antibiotics, and and those became available before Roe versus Wade. So. Um, there was a steep decline in them, women dying from abortions um, before abortion was legalized. So I think that that's a big argument for you know why a lot of people who um, you know I think are very humane people, but w- why they support this procedure, which you know I think is a real atrocity, and I think it's they're afraid of women dying. But it's the thing is that antibiotics. Um, you know, they were widely available even with illegal abortions before Roe versus Wade. So um, the only thing that Roe versus Wade did was make have was that more women have abortions now. It's not that abortion is safer than it was before. So one of my my friends and I were sitting around. He was working at this this drugstore not too far from here, and um, we were like, he was having a break, and we're looking through this details magazine. You know, it's a mm-hmm. magazine for fashion, and they're talking about you know life for women before Roe v. Wade, and they had this this t- t- statistic out there like. So many women died each year uh, before abortion was made legal, and, and they give they give it how much per year? Well, then they said they broke it down for for some reason they broke it down for every, how many per week died mm-hmm. because even after abortions was made legal. Mm-hmm. And my friend took out his calculator, and there was ten thousand more people each year, women dying wow. each year yeah. after abortion was allegedly. But this was right in this wasn't in a pro life pamphlet or anything else. This was in a details magazine, but people just skated over like, oh yeah, the, the, the number given per week seemed a lot less than how many per year. Yeah, I mean, st- even though it's it's maybe safer for the women than it was, still there are all kinds of horrible things that are s- still happening now that abortion is legalized. You know, all you heard about, like, Gosnell, you know, the thing is that he's not really that un- uncommon. I mean, I mean that's a, a terrible... Um, reality of abortion. That's some, um, you know, not the subject of my my book. My book was specifically about why Jews um, should be pro-life, but nonetheless, yeah. that's um, well, I'll get, obviously, reality. Obviously, I'm at a disadvantage because I haven't got a chance to read the book, so it's just getting it today, but uh, mm-hmm. I really do appreciate it, by the way, for that. But um, I do think that, um, I just look at the fact that Jews are like a overwhelmingly small minority in the, you know, the world, and uh, I think they would be like I think if I was a Jew, I think I'd, I'd actually have kids, and I want them to have kids as soon as possible. Because I mean, you want you know want you want your generations out there, and right. if we do it, let's face it. I mean, we ex- depend on the generations, the future generations coming up, and actually have in place. I'll put this proviso there, you know, with a work, uh, wor- you know, a value for a working and stuff like that, and contributing to society, so we can have the their incomes coming in for the social security benefits also because we've got to have people taking care of people old folks homes and nursing homes and taking mom and dad to their doctor's office appointments mm-hmm. and stuff so we need the future generations to keep us i mean we have to have that kind of we should have that kind of safety net you mm-hmm. know that's a form of safety net right so i mean it goes back to what your idea is saying basically people value having value because they can be part of that yeah and jews are very pro-family like you know you see how the congregations, how the the kids are going to the Hebrew um, day schools and stuff, and, and they're just, um, we really put a huge value on, on our children. And um, in the Jewish tradition, historically, the the uh, kid wasn't considered a person, actually, until it was a few days old, like maybe three days or five days. I've heard different things. But the reason for that wasn't just because they didn't value the life of, of a newborn baby or, or it was because um historic this was before the advances in medical technology they're just um they weren't able to keep babies alive very very well um, you know it was a, it was a very sad thing when when babies da- died but it was um th- they weren't able to prevent it um but it wasn't because it was desirable to to kill off the, the newborn babies or anything like that so um and there were elaborate rituals that had to be done in, in the case of um, of a death. So it just wasn't practical to carry out all of the rituals um, 
every time there was a miscarriage or something like that. So that's why, um, you know, you, you ju it was it just was not a practical thing to see an unborn baby as a full-fledged person because there were all these um, rituals that there was just no way anyone could afford to, to do all those rituals every time there was a miscarriage or a newborn baby died. But it wasn't because of a lack of caring about the, the unborn babies or newborn babies. That was just the reality of the situation. So, but... Now, another thing is too the emotional thing. I mean, the psychological. I mean, you're mm -hmm. you back in the older times. Older times, you, you didn't have access to antibiotics, which has probably saved. I wouldn't want to guess how many lives been saved by the introduction of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And like you already you already made reference to. Um, another thing is that mo basically keeping yourself an emotional distance and not you know putting the child a name on the child or putting too much emotional investment in it. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably a prudent thing. I mean, in that era, I mean, I, I definitely would, if they just had the kid and walked away from it, that'd be a horrific thing. But I can understand having this emotional distance to basically weigh how things were going with this child. Because how many times can you, I mean, I've heard of women who did lose their children even back then when it was more commonplace mm -hmm. and they just lost it. They were like institutionalized. Right. And I've heard of, uh, there are several instances of that happening in, in the Flint area when I was growing up, I heard stories about that when women in the 1870s and 1880s lost, you know, all their children, you know, newborns, and um, they just were inconsolable. They basically had some kind of psychotic break, you know, so, I mean, it was, it was got to, that's got to, you got to have this emotional protection, you know, so the psychological protection, and I think that's what those kind of, that was safeguarding, you know. That, that could be, yeah. It's like, a, that's not possible, another explanation, but, um, now what, what the, was there like a series of arguments or debates on Facebook or the, amongst your friends that prompted you to write this book? Or? <laughs> uh, no, it was just basically the experience of um, being a Jew and f feeling very connected with the Jewish community, but at the same time there's this dissonance because I'm pro-life. And um, I did become pro-life, I have to, just um, full disclosure, by being around Christians um, who that was part of their religious ideology, part of the doctrines of their faith. But they also, um, at least the ones who persuaded me, were able to give intellectual arguments. So the fact that it may be the reason they they were originally were pro-life was maybe their faith. It doesn't, just because it's, it's from someone's religion, doesn't mean that they can't also give intellectual arguments in its favor. Like, you know, for example, the unborn baby has its own DNA. It's not the same... You know, it's not the same individual as the mother. You know, its DNA is different. It's you know, often a different gender. <laughs> and, um, you know, just that it's human tissue, like it's not, a, it's not a dog or a cat or a pig or a goat. You know, it's a human. So, so it's, you know, it's a human life and it's growing. Like the cells are dividing. So, it, you know, it's alive. It's, you know, it's not dead unless you, it's miscarried or something. So, um, you know, so seeing it as a living human being. And, and that didn't click with me right away because I grew up in a, you know, pro-choice family. And, um, you know, but once it did click, once it suddenly, I suddenly sort of realized, wait a minute, this, this is an actual human being, you know, that makes you see it differently, you know. And, and again, I don't care if you see it as being a, a living human or a potentially living human, you know, that doesn't matter. It's still, you know, it's, it's human and, and, you know, it's developing inside the mother. So why would you not care about it? And um, you know, I, I'm someone who cares a lot about animals. I'm a vegetarian, except I eat seafood. And, um, you know, I've, I've always been connected to caring about an animal's feelings, even if it's not the same as, a, you know, a person. So caring about, you know, caring about animals came, comes natural to me. So, like, why would I not care about a, you know, developing human baby, you know? So... Just have to, you know, it's just, I think, I, I actually see it as not necessarily part of the, you know, conservative, you know, it could be part of the liberal tradition too, because I think liberals are more likely than conservatives to be like vegetarians or, you know, connected to animal rights. And it seems like if you, if you care about animals, why would you not care about, you know, babies? <laughs> So. Yeah, I always thought that was weird. I had friends, I had fr people I knew in college, can't say friends, mm -hmm. who were, you know, very pro-choice, mm -hmm. but also steadfastly, like PETA members, and which has got their own issues. I mean, PETA's not that organization I thought it was, you know, and more has come to light. But uh, anyway, they were like, they were like so cavalier about human life, but they were trying to protect, you know, sea otters and all these other mm -hmm. animals. And I'm like, well, okay, at some point, you got to realize that somebody's got to be in the future with a voice. Mm -hmm. 
and you know actually can go to court and go to the government bodies to actually get the slaughter to stop or get this pollution to stop so who's going to do that if you if you don't encourage you know humans to have babies i mean right. i just thought it was kind of a and it is it's kind of like a suicide of thought you basically keep on reducing the platform you're making your argument from by and basically pulling out the you know the underpinnings and then you're where you go, how are you going to stand and I, that's what I think they got to. I just think, and I guess they're, they're trying to motivate it because they don't want to feel like they're harsh or overly judge, overly judgmental. Mm -hmm. But I think that's there's some things you got to say. There's got to you know stop, time out. We got to look right. at this. And then uh, one of the things I want to put, make sure I get in. It's not real related to what you just said necessarily, but um, I think often in the abortion argument you hear the thing about well, what about rape? The case of rape, no one likes to think about that, but that's one of the issues that always comes up. And it's a reality. And um, one of the things specifically in our Jewish tradition, um, you have to look at the way that we, um, you know, if you're going to talk about the way you treat the unborn um, child of a rapist, let's look at the way that our Jewish community treats a rapist. Or, well, um, you know, that's one thing I talk a lot about in my book. Um, a guy that, you know, suppose a guy's on trial for rape. We don't know if he's innocent or guilty. Our tradition teaches us that it's better to let a thousand um, guilty people go than to um, convict one innocent person. That was the Jewish philosopher Maimonides said that. And out of that um, comes this Jewish tradition of um, great concern for the rights of defendants, you know, maybe, maybe sort of a, a little bit, you know, to the point of ridiculousness sometimes, you know, being overly, you know, getting... A defendant off on a technicality, and um, you know we have a, a lot. A lot of Jews become lawyers. You know, it's, it's a stereotype, but it's also true. And um, so a lot of Jewish lawyers have shaped our legal system with concern for the rights of defendants. And um, but then even if someone is convicted, you know if he's been shown guilty of rape. You know, maybe raping even more than one woman. Um, we still have a tradition of um, being concerned about the rights of people who are in prison, like we wouldn't want to see them tortured. Um, Jews tend to be against the death penalty. It, it's That's also part of our tradition. There, um, there's a statement, you know, if a, a court sentences someone to death once every 70 years, that's a bloodthirsty court. Um, I, I think that's one way Jews and Christians are or at least a lot of Christians are, are, are different. I mean, you know, there are Christians who are against the death penalty too, but I, I think that, the, you know, this is a specifically Jewish um, tradition of, of um, being reluctant to execute anyone, like even someone that you know is guilty, and we'd want the, um, someone who's in prison to, you know, we want the, the function of this prison sentence to be their rehabilitation, not just to punish them and make them suffer. And, um, you know, we wouldn't want them to be sentenced to jail or to prison any longer than, you know, than what's allowed by law. You know, the day that they're supposed to be freed, we wouldn't want them to be freed. And so we have all this um, concern for the rights of, of a man who has raped a woman. And so why do we have no concern for the right of an innocent baby? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't know. Yeah, I think that's an, that is a, you know, interesting thing to talk about. Thing that people haven't addressed. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. another thing is I think we talked about this before the show started. Um, we before we started doing the interview that um, there's a lot of concerns for overpopulation. Mm -hmm. That's been like you know, Malthus wrote about in his, in his treatise on uh, years back in the 1700s that about overpopulation. Basically, it was disastrous. I mean, he predicted doom and gloom, and we have seen that that has not been borne out because you know the you know, advent of certain types of uh, agricultural procedures. I mean, we got an amazing agricultural base here which is a big concern for feeding people is a big concern for having a lot of people or for any group number of people and um in the united states i think it's one or two percent of our population is employed in those areas of agriculture yet they produce enough for ourselves and better chunk of the world so i mean those concerns that Malthus raised mm -hmm. at one time were very very um pertinent but you know, he would—he didn't have the crystal ball, and he never predicted he did. He just said, based upon what he saw at that point, he conjectured right. that it was going to happen. Um, I think that's, you know, and I think there's, I think we have to have more concentration now because it has changed. And we're doing things we're doing now for produce, production of food is this waiting for a disaster to happen, so have a horrific famine to strike. And I think we can offset that by encouraging, you know, urban gardening, people have their own gardens, mm -hmm. actually maybe reducing you know, what types of food they're going to be eating, get to use more, you know, getting into the habit of using 
dry and beans and stuff like that, which is more ready procurable and also more easy to store. So they're like stable staple items, mm -hmm. and uh, those kind of things can be offset. Right. Now, yeah. But I mean, those things we can plan ahead. We know we've seen the cat catastrophes, mm -hmm. and we know what possibly we have to face. Now we can't predict it. What's going to happen? Yeah, and I think um, this might even be from all in the family. <laughs> so, um, I, I think there was something where Mike and Gloria weren't sure if they wanted to bring a baby into the world and this, whatever it was. But one of the arguments for the, the, that they came up with for having a baby was, well, maybe my baby will c come up with the solution to some of these problems. So, I'm, you know, each person has a chance of helping the, to solve those problems. So, I, you know, I think we should... You know, including any of the um, things that we associate typically with overpopulation, that it might not be too many people. There might be some other way to solve the problem. Yes, and that's a the thing you've brought back in a couple of times during this, uh, you know, this discussion so far is the unrealized potential of humans. Mm -hmm. And um, my grandfather was a businessman. He was like, um, I think he went as far as sixth or seventh grade in education formally. And he wasn't, I would say, considered humanitarian, but he used to, he used to be in the hospitality business, restaurant owner, bar owner. Mm -hmm. And he used to tell me, he said, you can get a new French fryer, French fry, you know, a fryer, you can get a new stove, you can get a new dishwasher. Your best asset is your people. Mm -hmm. And now he realized this. I mean, he didn't read great books on this. I mean, I think he only had maybe a handful of books in his entire library. Most mm -hmm. of those like sports, uh, uh, sports facts. He was big into baseball and stuff like that. But uh, he recognized this as a business guy. He basically knew that basically the way he would sum it up probably because he never said it, but basically get more flies with honey and do a vinegar. So, I mean, you know, you got to be you got to approach people like you think they think you value them. And I think we got to have that. We got to have that approach to people. We don't know their assets. I mean, we can learn from anybody. Not everybody's a teacher, but they can all everybody can teach something. You know, to, to, being a teacher overall, it has acquirements that most people don't possess. But. There is one thing or two things that somebody can convey to us. We can learn from them. And I think that's probably the, probably with the thing we got to really value that we have a tendency to shrug off and shirk that idea that, you know, uh, people do have value. For sure, yeah. I mean, oh, I, I just want to, um, this isn't related to what you just said, but one of the things you said before that I, I was going to talk about, you, you were talking about people grieving for um, after an abortion, and that is a, a well-known phenomenon. One of my friends um, is is a grief counselor, and one of the categories of people that she counsels is people, who, um, women who have had abortions and um, are grieving, and um, you know it. I, I don't know exactly what, what the issues are, like how it might be different from um, grieving for a baby that, you know, that is born. But um, women do grieve after an abortion. And I've heard that, you know, women who are raped and, and have an abortion also grieve. It's not like, um, like women who are raped and have abortions are, are some different category from every other kind of women. It, you know, it's the same, the same thing. And it, and I've also heard that, like the bonding, when women start bonding with a baby um, as it's developing inside the womb, and that that happens automatically, you know, no matter what the circumstances of the baby's conception. So, well, anyway, this is a thought-provoking, you know, discussion. And I've, the book uh, "Pro Life Is Jewish: Why the Matriarchs Would Eject the Abortion" by Laura Fetter Bush. And also, I'm going to give you an unintended. You know, you didn't know this, but I got the other book covers up here. Uh, you have. Uh, you have three other books. Uh, you got Life on the Guest List, Flat Earth, and Asexual or the Life and the Love and Sex Life of a Romantic Asexual, which we just did an interview a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, and uh, I'm trying to get this other one. I got one of the books lined up behind the other one, so hold on, I'm gonna try to get it away from the other one here. <laughs> And it's like, well, anyway, I can't get it. So anyway, uh, <laughs> but it's like the the uh, flat earth theories out there. You got, and these are all available on Amazon, correct? Right, yes. So, so for, you can get a printed version of it as well as an e-book version of it, right? Yeah, that's right, Kindle. And, yeah. and, and um, you've been, like I said, you're prolific as a writer. I mean, it's like, <laughs> of course, yeah, the books are relatively small in size. but Yeah, I mean, they're all pretty short, yeah. But how many people I know, though, always said, you know, I got to write a book, I got to write a book. And I, they, <laughs> my mom was that way. And well, now it's it. incredibly easy to um, do this. Well, I went to but I did it through um, this website, Create Space, and you can do it for free. I mean, you could also do it if you want to pay for services; those are available too. If you if you want to pay, but you can also do it for free. You have to pay for the copies that you buy, but other than that, it's it's free. So anyone out there who wants to write a book, you know, there's no excuse not to now. Now you got several, and I mean, and the divergence of topics here, and the life on the guest list is more of autobiographical, right? I. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a novel, but it's uh, yeah, pretty much autobiographical. Yeah. And the uh, flat Earth, I mean, uh, that that's got a lot of views, and we that that you know interview we did about that one's got a lot of views. It's generated quite a, quite a bit of controversy, and um, I hope this one does because I mean I'm definitely on board for people examining why they basically accepted this you know line that th this kind of cavalier attitude towards abortion. Right. I mean, if it could challenge it one or two people, and they actually reflect on this and. Would, would your aim be to consider maybe help it stop maybe one or two abortions or a mass amount of abortions? Or would that be, would you be like really great, grateful to see that happen? Well, I, I would certainly be grateful to see that happen. I just, um, you know, I feel like a lot of the, the people who are on the pro-life side, is, well, it's, oh, it seems like it's almost all, um, you know, from Christian um, theology viewpoints. And, you know, that's not, not entirely true. There's a group, I'm a member of um, Secular Pro-Life on Facebook, you know, so there, as you said, there are atheists who are pro-life, there are, you know, gay people who are pro-life, there's, you know, liberals who are pro-life, Democrats who are pro-life. So um, it's been identified as being a certain variety of, um, you know, maybe fundamentalist Christians or Catholics. And so I think people often feel like, um, you know, if, if they somehow take a pro-life stance, they're, um, you know, that they're I, I don't know. It's, it somehow makes it the issue more polarizing than I think it has to be. I think um, there there would be more people. I, some pe a lot of people I think are afraid to say that they're pro life, um, and um, you know, and the term pro life even or pro choice those are those are sort of um, polarizing terms also. I mean, there's not a, not all pro life or you know people who call themselves pro life would agree on any number of issues. Just as I'm sure not all people who are pro choice would agree with. Each other each other on any number of issues. Those are just sort of, um, you know, ways of pigeonholing people. So, Yeah, because I'd like to see more people around in the future so they can continuously debate who's right, you know, the far left, the far right. I'd like to see the far right and the far left exist in the future. And that's the reason why, I mean, but like I said, I'm not like one of these flamboyant types of anti-abortion people. I just, to me, I just, I don't have that in me to be that Mm -hmm. denunciatory or to be that you know that be out there in the forefront because mm -hmm. the first thing that's charged is a it's shot at a male is well you don't know what it's like to have a kid it's that's not your body and you can't really argue against that but i mean mm -hmm. at some point you know but it's also the the, the man's you know, the unborn baby it's inside the woman but it it is his child like i, I don't think a lot of the fit feminists or anyone who makes that argument, well, you're a man, so you have no right to an opinion. I, I don't think that they would want men to be totally dissociated from the child once it's born. Like, you know, he should, you know, the, I don't think they'd be happy with a man who said, well, it's, you know, I, 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 it wasn't in my body. It has nothing to do with me. I don't care about it. You know, like, the, I, I think women want men to be involved with their children's lives, and it's better for society the, the more involved a man is. So, I don't see how that argument is helpful. Well, anyway, I'm glad you came up here and talked about your new book. And I, you know, you get kind of, you know, I didn't know you actually had when did, when did you finish writing this, this book here? Uh, I think um, about a month or so ago. So, yeah, so it came, it came, for me, it came out of the blue. You didn't recognize, you know, we talked about an interview and I was like, okay, I didn't know you had <laughs> Yeah, well, it right. came out after, whenever we had our talk, I think this show actually motivated me to write it. So. Oh, cool. I mean, so we did something. We motivated... Yes. We had we had, well, we helped her because you're, you're pretty. <laughs> I've been thinking about the ideas for a while, but it motivated me to put it in book form. So. No, I'm glad you did because I think this is something that's like it's you know I'd like to see this in the hands. It's a thin volume, but I mean I think it. I'd like to see. I know I can see this. Maybe you've never uh, visioned this, but I could probably see this getting added to over a period of time because you know you're going to have people maybe contacting you with <laughs> arguments and debates or issues or even some stuff to bolster your argument. And I'd like to, but I, I think it's a great. I mean it, this is. This is great that you actually sat down and wrote it. And hey, people, if you got a book in you, you never know until you can sit down and sit. Obviously, she's produced four, and she's a busy woman. She's <laughs> she's a busy woman. She's got her own career going as a harpist. She's uh, playing all the time in different places, and uh, you know it's you know you can't use that for excuse, folks. Um, so anyway, get off your duff, or maybe get on your duff. <laughs> sit down in front of a word processing unit or a computer or whatever. And start writing. So, anyway, Pro Life is Jewish by the Matrix of Reject Abortion by Laura Futterbush. Also, other uh, titles are out there at Amazon. And I hope you just see a sudden surge in sales there. So, anyway, thanks for coming in again. Thank and um, I hope everybody enjoyed this uh, talk with us.